What's up, everybody? How are you guys doing? Good. Is it still raining? I got to tell, tell you a story. I'm, I'm glad I'm here this morning because one of the most terrifying things uh, that's ever happened to me happened this morning. I was driving down I-94 in an absolute downpour, sheets of rain coming down, when my wipers just decided to freeze in the middle of my windshield. And I'm like, this is the end. It's all over. I can't see a thing. I can't see the cars around me. I can't see the cars in front of me. I can't see the guardrails. But thank God I'm here. And thank God there weren't a whole lot of people traveling at 845 down I-94. Um, so I was able to pull over. But you all made it. Some of your friends didn't. Well, we're in this book called James. And if you're visiting with us, let me introduce myself. My name is Dan. I'm the lead pastor here. I would love to meet you. I said this last week. I'm not a big hugger, but if that's what you need, uh, I'm available for that. Pray for me now. Um, but I will do that. We're in this book called James, this series on the book of James. And some first things that you got to understand, if you're, if you're new to this series, James, the guy who wrote James, isn't the apostle James that we see as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, James, which was the brother, that is the disciple of Christ, was the brother of John. They were called the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. This is not that James. James is actually the half-brother of Jesus. He was the brother of Jesus. Why was he the half-brother? Well, it's because um, Jesus had a mother that produced him, right? But not a father. Are you... Are you flowing with me? Like, Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit of God and an immaculate conception is what they called by the mother Mary, where James, his brother, had both parents. So there you go, half-brother, just some Bible trivia you can impress your friends with at your parties later today. But one of the most fascinating things about the book of James is that this is Jesus' brother. He would have grown up around Jesus. He would have seen him in all of his action and his glory and, and, it, and the Bible records that Jesus' brothers didn't just all of a sudden, when Jesus said, I am God, they didn't all of a sudden say, we believe you. Now think about that for a second. One of your siblings that you grew up with all of a sudden claims to be God. What would be your first response? Let me take you over here to this psychological institution and we will check you in for evaluation. That would have probably been your response, my response. And, and, it, and the Bible records that James comes to faith in Jesus, and then he believes, so in other words, he believes him that he is the son of God, that he is the savior of the world, he is God in the flesh, and he becomes a follower of his brother. Think about that, listening to your brother and calling him Lord. Like, you're my God. You, you have the right to tell me what to do and how to do it. And James, this guy who becomes a follower of his brother because he believes he is God, man, he becomes the leader in the Jerusalem church. And some things start to happen in the Jerusalem church where they're scattered and, and they're trying to bring people back together. And there's some issues that are happening inside the church. And, and, and so James writes this, this book, this, this, this series of of, of instructions for how we are to change our lives. And so if you missed last week, I got to tell you, you got to go back and listen to it because so often we approach God and we approach the word of God with, man, I don't know if I like that. I don't know if I agree with that. Man, God, you need to change what you say to fit what I want. And that's not how it works. When I approach God's word, when I approach God, I say, God, your ways are my ways. And we said this, that the mark of a believer, that someone who has really given their life to Christ, the way that you would know it is they actually like God telling them what to do and how to live. And so we're in this book, and, and so we're going to go into James chapter 2 this morning. We're going to start the second chapter of James. We're going to dive into it. And honestly, before we do, let's, let's take an opportunity to pray with, for just a moment. Will you pray with me? Church online, you can pray as well. Say, Heavenly Father, right here and right now, all of us who are in this room listening to the sound of my voice, we pray that we would hear your voice. God, that you would speak and that we would receive. 
God, through your word, that we would respond with yes and amen, that we would respond with, God, you are God and I am not. We come here in humility to say, God, your way will reign in my life. God, no matter what culture says, no matter how I grew up, no matter what I think about it, God, what you say, I will do in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. Amen. So James chapter 2, he goes into it and I'm already, there we go, it works. And James says, my brothers and sisters, so this is a cue, right? He's not talking about everybody in the world. He's talking about believers in Christ, people who have been adopted sons and daughters of Christ. My brothers and sisters who are in the church, believers. He says, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Now, I highlighted this word glorious because you need to understand some things about theology. In this particular passage of scripture, he's not saying, man, I just believe in a savior. I don't just believe in a God. No, we have experienced the glory of God. Let me explain it just a little bit differently. In the Old Testament, when when Moses, Big Mo as I like to call it, was called by God to lead the Israelite people, the people of God, out of Egyptian slavery. This is what happened. These people were enslaved. God let them out, did all these miraculous things. The glory of God was seen and experienced by the people of God. But here's what's crazy. He takes them into the wilderness, and day by day, day by night, day and night, excuse me, day and night, The glory of God dwelt in what? The tabernacle. It was the first portable church. Thank God we're not a portable church anymore. Can I get an amen? But the very first church was a portable church. They set up and tore down the tabernacle everywhere they went. And and, and in that was the glory of God. It was called the Shekinah glory. It's a a Jewish... um, Hebrew term that explains the presence of God, the power of God, the miraculous acts of God, that you would experience him, not just claim, hey, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. No, 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 that you have experienced his glory. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like there's a difference. It's not just I know and I think it's, it's man, no, no, God, I've experienced your wonder and I am in awe of who you are. And those of us who have experienced this, must not show favoritism. And I, I, today I'm going to make the argument with the book of James that we are not just in our world, but in the church, divided people. They say that, when I say they, it means a lot of people would say that Sunday mornings is the most divided hour in the entire week. Whoa. And and so we're going to dive into this idea of favoritism because not just outside of the church, but inside of the church, James is saying that we're seeing people showing favoritism to one or the other. And and so I'm going to use this illustration before we get started. (laughs) Think about some of you who how many of y'all love football? How many of y'all like, man, half you guys, did I just lose you? Do you like softball, baseball? Do you like the arts? I don't know what it is. But let's say that I had a Michigan person standing right here. Do I have any Michigan people? First person to get up here, come up here, Michigan person. Ohio State person, come sit, stand over here. Come on, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, wear it loud and proud, you're Ohio State. Hey, hey, Michigan person, hey. Share the stage with your Ohio State brother. How many Michigan State people do I got? Yeah. Well, who's going to come up? Quickly, quickly. So you are Ohio State. You're Michigan. Go blue. What do you guys say? The Ohio State University. Can I dot the I? Isn't that what they do? And you're Michigan State. Yes, sir. How many of you 
when you walked into church this morning, would go hang out with Jeff because he's an Ohio State Buckeye. And you would completely ignore Mr. Michigan State Sparty and the Michigan Go Blue Wolverine. That team up north, as they say. Okay, you guys can go. Y'all pick, picking up what I'm putting down? We show favoritism. Now, James, in this book, is going to, as, as I say, he's going to get up in our grill. Like, and that's, honestly, that's why I love James. I, I was, again, I was a football player, an athlete, and, and how many of y'all loved the coaches that screamed and yelled at you? Some of you. <laughs> Not many of you. I loved it. I loved it. Why? Because I believe that my coach wanted better for me. James gets up in my grill, gets up in your grill, so that we can become more like Jesus, not just better, worshipful versions of ourselves. Like, we don't just want to worship ourselves, we worship Jesus. So here, here we go. Here's what James does. Suppose a man comes into your meeting. Now, he's talking about the church. He's talking about the gathering place. And in his context, it would have been the synagogue or the temple or the ecclesia. That's the church gathering. He's talking specifically to people in the church. Suppose a man comes in to your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. He looks all that. Man, he looks like Anna Delphi, has it all together. She's just perfect. And a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. And if you spo show special attention to Go Blue, the Michigan fan, wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, Ohio State fans, <laughs> you go stand over there. Or sit, better yet, you can't have a seat. You just sit and, 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 and grab the scraps in front of me. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You're, you're judging other people, and your thoughts are evil. Don't show favoritism. So the first thing we got to understand is that God desires togetherness and not division. That when it comes to his gathering... No matter what your background is, no matter how you grew up, no matter, social, no matter what social economic uh, uh, family structure you grew up in, you come together in the body of Christ, in the church. Um, let me just look around the room for a second. I don't know how to say this politically correctly, so I'm just going to say it. Y'all are very white. If, if I were to go down the street to, I, I had a, a, a conversation with a pastor friend of mine. He leads a Hispanic church down the road. If I were to go there, guess what you'd see? Mostly Hispanic people. And you know what's crazy? He was telling me, he was telling me that it's actually divided within the Hispanic community, or not even Hispanic, maybe in the, in the Latino community, because he, he grew up Peruvian. And Peruvians don't really do their thing with Mexican, Hispanic, Latino people. It doesn't just exist in the white church, the black church. God says do not show favoritism. God desires togetherness and not division. And so here's what I'm going to say to you. There's an evil desire in all of us that shows favoritism. And honestly, it starts with Satan himself. He is the troubler. Where, where, we, where God wants his people to come together in unity, in worship of Christ. He even puts it this way, that there is one master, that there is one faith, that there is one baptism, that there is one God who works in all and through all. Do you see the vision there? Do you see go blue and, and go sparty? Go green. Go white. And here's how he, here's how he says it. Check this out. Peter began to speak. <laughs> this is crazy to me. He began to speak in the book of Acts. He went to this guy's house named Cornelius, and he, he had all these people gathered there that were Samaritans. Now, if you know anything about Jewish culture, Jewish culture, Jewish people did not hang out with Samaritans. It was a thing. Like, there was a dividing line. 
There was a national boundary that you don't cross. Ooh, now I'm getting, going from preaching to meddling. Be, Peter began to speak to these Samaritans. He's a Jewish person, and he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. <laughs> this is the same Peter who was with Jesus, who, while standing at the well, interacted with a Samaritan woman who says, man, I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. And he saw Jesus interact with this person. This is the same Peter who was with Jesus when all the Pharisees, all the teachers of the law, looked at him and said, you're just eating with tax collectors and sinners. You're showing <laughs> favoritism. And so this is Peter. Peter's watching all this unfold with Jesus. And yet, after Jesus dies and is resurrected, Peter's doing his thing as a follower of Christ. And, 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 and months, maybe even years after that, he now realizes that God does not show favoritism. How many of you show favoritism? half of you are liars because you're just sitting there arms crossed. You show favoritism. I, sh I show favoritism. I was sitting at a house with my buddies speaking of the football thing. <laughs> and, and we're talking football, right? We're like, who's going to win the national championship? Who's going to go to the, the playoffs? And, and I said, man I, I, man, I think LSU maybe. I think, man, I don't know. Uh, who else did I say? Uh, Michigan might be up there. They're pretty good. And Texas. And I said, I'm not biased, am I? Of course I am. Of course I'm biased. How many of you parents out there have a favorite kid? <laughs> oh, don't say it. Depends on the moment of the day, right? How many of you have a favorite coworker? A favorite wife. No, did yet. <laughs> the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance. So Samuel was charged by God to go out and find the next ruler, the next king. And Samuel looks at this guy who comes before him and he says, man, this guy is tall. Man, he's buff. He's got a tan. Man, he could take out some army. He's he, some armies. Man, he's a great leader. He looks at, it, at him from the outside. And the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. Why? Because the Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, what they look like, what they dress like, how skinny they are or fat they are. You know, my, um, our staff this week told me that I need to figure out how to dress better, which isn't offensive at all, right? And, and, I, and I told them, I said, I've been, I've been begging Kelsey to help me for years. But Kelsey does her own thing, right? She comes up, she worships, she does all these things. The last thing she wants to do on Sunday morning is tell me what to, to wear. So I, if you've ever shown up on a Sunday morning and thought, what is he wearing? It's because I've been figuring it out on my own. <laughs> it's not a gift set. Um, and so this week, our, our team came together and they were like, this is what you need to wear. And, so, and, and I'll tell you why. This is, this is free of charge. This background right here apparently did not look good with the shirt I was wearing last week. I thought the shirt was awesome. By the way, they chose this outfit, and I got to take it off because I am sweating. Sometimes practical is better than, you know, looking good. By the way, when they tried to say that I, they needed to fix me and make me more trendy, I said, fat doesn't do trendy. It just doesn't. God, guys, this is funny stuff. <laughs> but God, God doesn't look at the appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. One of the most famous speeches, right, in all of American history was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who said all this stuff about, you know, not looking at the appearance, but, but looking at the condition of a heart, what, what someone does in their actions, who they are beyond what they look like and how they grew up and how much money they have or don't have. 
Do you know where he stole that from? He plagiarized that from God. Guys, I am way funnier than this. James continues and says, if you really keep the royal law, law found in the scripture, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know what the, the biggest hindrance to people loving their neighbor as yourself? Do you know what it is? You don't love yourself. The greatest hindrance of you actually loving people that don't look like you, didn't grow up like you, don't have the same amount of resources you have, someone that's different than you, is because of your own insecurities. You, you don't even love yourself. How are you going to love someone else if you don't actually love the person who you look in the mirror at? And, and so we got to... We got to learn this, that if we want to keep the royal law found in Scripture, man, we got to love people for who they are and, and for what, not what they look like, but the, the condition of their heart. We got to look at ourselves and, and realize, man, do I even like, <laughs> some of you, do you even like the person you're looking in the mirror at? Let alone love the person you're looking in the mirror at. Last week, right, I, I shared this awesome illustration that, you guys have probably uh, written down and put, put on your mirrors and stuff, is, is, is that the Bible is like a mirror that, that it shows us stuff intimately that, that looks good or doesn't look good. And, and last week I shared that I looked in the mirror and I saw some big old hairy nostrils. Yeah, I did. Those of you who are under 30, you don't understand this yet. And I could have either just let them flow and ended up with a, hairy nose mustache, or I could have plucked them. The word of God is getting up in our grill saying, don't show favoritism. And you can either hear that and respond to it with not showing favoritism, or you can continue to live how you're living. But it starts with, man, how do you love yourself? But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. <laughs> How many of y'all knew that favoritism was a, was a sin? You think about lying and cheating and killing people and, man, sleeping with someone that's not my wife or not my husband, watching pornography. You, you think about sins that are all sorts of egregious, like, like stealing or hurting someone or all these things. Like, you think about those sins, but you don't think about how you treat other people that don't look like you, that didn't grow up like you. And, and, and he's saying, they're literally saying, that's just as much of a sin. Watch what happens. The second one is showing favoritism is a sin. And here's what it looks like. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. How many of you have, um, like the Pharisees did, this kind of self-righteous, I have it all together, I I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to show you how great I, I, I am and how awesome I have it, and, and man, you just look down on everybody else. Y'all work with anybody like that? Y'all married to anyone like that? It gets quiet during the book of James. Have any of you kept the whole law? No, because... All of us are sinners, the Bible says. We're, we're all sinners. We've, we've broken God's law. I, <laughs> I got to get this moving. It's, I have eight minutes left, nine minutes left. How many of y'all have heard the new, the new law about, like, being on your phones while driving? Yes. It's a pretty good law, isn't it? Yes. Pretty awesome law. I like it. I, I have to change to obey it, if I'm being honest. This week I was driving down the road. <laughs> I was driving down the road and I started to freak out because my phone was sitting right here. Like I have the little, like the, the attachment, what, is, what do you call it? The little magnet thing that sticks the phone. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's a cop coming. Is my phone in my hand? Because I'm so used to having my phone in my hand. I'm just being honest. It's right there. 
the police officer pulls up next to me because I started to slow down. How many of y'all slow down and see police officers and go like 20 and a 35? The police officer starts pulling by, and, and what do they have in their hand? And if you ask any police officer, I guarantee it, they'll be like, how hard is it to figure out who has their phone in their hand and don't, and doesn't? Well, how about this one? Marijuana is legal, but is driving while high legal? Have you ever seen me, anybody be pulled over for that? Oh, we're all guilty. And as James is going to put it, we can't point the finger at other people while we ourselves are guilty. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. But if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you're still a lawbreaker. And guess what, friends? You, most of you, you haven't murdered people. Most of you, you haven't committed adultery. Most of you, you haven't, man, um, what's another one? What's a, what's a big one? You haven't lied, right? You've all lied. Have you stolen? Are, are you a glutton, like you just eat so much and consume so much? Are you a drunkard, both in alcohol or any substance, whether it's legal or illegal? And yet, we think, oh man, that's not that big of a deal. And then you show favoritism. How about this one? Gossip. <laughs> if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of them all, the Bible says. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. But watch what James says, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And here's the big point of today. Because I know you're, you're feeling it, you're feeling the heaviness, you're feeling the punch, the punch of the gut, the, 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 maybe the, the biblical two by four that just got slammed upside your head and your spirit and your emotions and your soul. The greatest thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that I don't have to pay for my sin. That Jesus saw your evil. He saw your sin. He saw your adulterousness. He saw you watching pornography. He still does. He saw your acts of evil against each other. He saw your favoritism. He saw all of it. and he offered mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Hey, Christ follower, this is what James is saying. Hey, Christ follower, you've been given mercy. Be merciful. You've been given the greatest gift that's ever been given on planet Earth. You've been given mercy. You've been given forgiveness. You've received it and accepted it. How dare you not extend it to someone else? Because God doesn't look at the outside appearance. He, he looks at the heart. But here's a question that begs to be asked asked because I, I know that so many people, if we, we look at the scriptures, we can, we can take something and, and really like it and we go, man, I really like that mercy part. And, and man, he, he talks about, man, looking at people and showing favoritism based off of what they make and don't make. And, and even in James right there, he says, the rich people don't look down on those who are poor. And, and listen, poor people don't look down on those who have. Don't show favoritism. But Christ followers, you've been, you've been given mercy. And here's the question of the day. When someone sins, do you sow judgment or mercy even as an act of favoritism?
Here's what I mean. Can I get really real for a second? This is quite vulnerable, and I'm going to probably regret saying this, but I want to be as authentic and as real as possible. How many of y'all know that it took money to get into this space? Pretty obvious, right? During this process, I heard that, that one of our biggest givers had a specific sin. as I bet you would too, do I even say anything? <laughs> do I ruffle the feathers <laughs> and potentially lose this person? God, this dream you've given us to be permanent and not always portable. God, you've given us this dream to move in a, into a space that we can do ministry all throughout the week and at different times of the year, so much differently and better than we've ever done it before. Should I show this person favoritism because of what they give? And I thank God that this person sees it as a gift that when they're corrected, God loves them. It could have gone totally different. They ended up actually thanking me for calling them out on what their sin was and they actually told their friends and their co-workers, this is their words, that they had a pastor that loved them enough to even correct them in their sin. I could go further with that one, but I'm going to leave it there. God never pardons the sin. Look at me. He never pardons your sin. What do I mean by that? He doesn't just shuffle it under the carpet and say, you know what? I'm going to look away. I'm going to just pretend you're, you're, you're not doing. No, no, no. God hates sin. He loves the sinner. Hey, friend, when, when you're lying, God hates that. Hey, hey, friend, when you commit adultery, he hates that. Hey, when you commit murder, he hates that. When you show favoritism, he hates that. But guess what? He loves you. Do you know why I know that? Because Jesus Christ himself left his throne in heaven, was born in a manger, a feeding trough for animals, and lived a perfect life and died, died a sacrificial death. Why? Because the payment of sin, your sin and my sin is death, and death eternally. But thank God for Jesus Christ who bore the penalty of sin on your behalf and on my behalf. Do y'all know, know what it means to, like, flip someone off? Kids, plug your ears. Do you know what the greatest flip-off to God is? When you receive his mercy and forgiveness and don't change. Do you know what flipping God off is like? is when you receive mercy and forgiveness for your sin and yet you hold sin against everybody else. Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, is up in the grill of the church telling us that we're not just to continue in our sin. No, 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 we gotta deal with it. We gotta change it. By the power of God and the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we will be changed, made brand new. God, I, how many of y'all feel this way? I thank God I'm not who I used to be, but man, I am not who I need to be in Christ Jesus, amen, until I become who he is and who he is like. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you for your word. We love you for your word that it... It not only communicates your heart of justice, 
but also your compassion for, for people. God, that you do share with us ways in which we need to change. God, you do not change. We change. And so God, right now, I pray that people are becoming thankful for your word that calls out our sin, that calls out our dysfunction, that calls out our brokenness. God, I pray that we would respond to it with humility. God, help me to change. Help me to be more like you. God, help me to not show favoritism as you have extended mercy and forgiveness to others. God, may we be the same to the others in our world. Jesus, you hung out with sinners, but you didn't become a sinner. So God, in this moment, I pray that we would realize that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And God, you came to earth and died a sacrificial death. And you did what we couldn't do. You defeated death and the grave and sin, and you rose again. God, with the offer that whoever would believe in you, confess their sin with their mouth, that, and believe in their heart that you are the Savior and Lord, that we would be redeemed, saved, and made new. And it's available to everyone who would respond to you in faith. Right here and right now, I pray for everyone in the room and anyone who's listening online that you would respond to the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of God right here and right now that we have a God who sees your sin and he's a just God that offers you forgiveness through the justice that was given to Jesus on your behalf. And so by faith now, you can receive salvation by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. With nobody looking around, all heads bowed, as an act of faith, you can receive forgiveness from God himself right here and right now. He only asks for one thing. That you believe, yes. But that you repent. Turning from your sin and turning to Jesus and his ways that you change. In this moment, if that's you, I want to ask you to shoot your hand up in the air and hold it up. Say, Jesus, I am here. I know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I have sinned. I've shown favoritism. I've stolen. I've Maybe I haven't killed or or slept with someone who wasn't my wife or husband. Maybe I haven't done some of those things that, that even the world seems egregious. But God, I have sinned. I've lied. I've shown some favoritism. I confess that sin, and I turn from it, and I turn to you. I receive your forgiveness in this moment. And in faith, I ask that you would come inside of me, Lord, and change me. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I give you everything I am and everything I'll ever be. In Jesus' name.